A bird blends into another, into the summer, into a tree, as the sky blends into an ocean, into a river, into me. Beautiful. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Solacene. This is the seventh episode in our nature series. My favorite thing about Aaron's poems is that he always, right before he starts to say them, gives a little mischievous grin. (laughs) Because of how nervous I am to give them. (laughs) What do you think that poem means? It means we're all one with nature. Mm, Very original thought. Mm. How about next week you can give your own original thought? You can write the poem. Okay, sure. One time a semester, I think that's a a fair (laughs) tax to pay for how often you receive my, you know, prodigious... Musings. Yes, musings. <laughs> so this week we asked, we are answering the questions of what mythological creatures have their foundation in nature or like where do they come from, as well as what is the environmental impact of the leisure industry. But first, if you haven't checked out our zine, it's available for purchase on our website, which is linked below. All proceeds from that are going to support Eco Justice, which is an environmental legal organization based out of Canada. And we also have a YouTube channel if you want to watch the videos on there of us conversing. (laughs) And that's pretty much it we have right now. There's a book club going on, but that's wrapping up. So maybe you can catch us next time. Yes. And whatever you're listening to this on, please give one of the star ratings, preferably five five stars. Mm. Or, you know, a positive rating. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Or a very, very, like, positive comment. Mm. Anyway, so... Mythological creatures. Do you want to guess which one I started with? You seem to enjoy the deep sea, so I'm going to go with Kraken. That's actually, that is correct. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know you've been peeking at my notes, though, so it's not that impressive. I never, ever, ever peek at your notes. However, for the listeners who don't get to see behind the scenes, every single week I'm accused of cheating. <laughs> but I don't know what cheating would even be. It's a conversation. But it feels like an exam to you, doesn't it? You feel the need to... To sneak peeks at whatever the professor, the professor me, has prepared. <laughs> okay, so tell us about the Kraken, Aaron. Well, as I found this this so, this um, the sonnet by mm. um, Alfred Tennyson, published in eighteen thirty, called the Kraken, and it ends like this: There hath he lain for ages, and will lie, battening upon huge sea worms in his sleep, until the latter fire shall heat the deep. Then once by man and angels to be seen, in roaring he shall rise, and on the surface die now apparently the sonnet has like some political uh symbolism and imagery that i don't really want to touch but what really struck me about it just with regards to the kraken which for people who don't know is like this mythologized um by sailors and the seafaring folk grand squid which is tends to be very powerful very violent and i'm quite sure is just the combination of the giant squid or the colossal squid and the imagination of sailors who were on the sea for a very long time in dark conditions, Mm -hmm. stormy conditions, and they saw tentacles, and their boat was being whipped back and forth, and they were like, oh no, it's it's an evil being from the deep, which I suppose wasn't that far off. Um, But I just, what I really liked about this this poem is that it has a feel of the transcendent to it. It it has like a really religious and... um, indeed like revelations apocalyptic vibe to it that like this this creature you know it describes it as being asleep um deep below mm. and it's like it, as the poem says when the latter fire reaches it which could be you know um interpreted as like a a, a legit religious apocalyptic thing but mm-hmm. maybe we want to squeeze some some climate metaphor out of it also um there's this feeling that it kind of exists for the most part outside of regular nature mm. where most things only sleep for like 12 hours at a time or less. This one sleeps for perhaps eons. And when it wakes and dies, that symbolizes the waking and, and subsequent death of something that shouldn't really be awake or dead. Yeah. Maybe I I'm see. reaching here, but that, that's it. I wanted to start with this because it's like mythological animals or human-animal hybrids, or just these crazy creatures that we've come up with, they're often considered anthropomorphized versions of natural concepts. Mm. But this is almost like the opposite. It's almost like everything alien about the world squeezed into one thing that we don't understand. Yes. Yeah, the inexplicable ebbs and flows of society and... Yes, yes. The deep 
evil within all of us is perhaps in the Kraken. And obviously Lovecraft tapped into this imagery very vividly with a Cthulhu or however you pronounce it. And I think that's also a, an important thing to note that there's mythology, which has been kind of baked in the oven for like centuries or even millennia. But then it's, it's always really cool when a modern artist or storyteller can immediately capture that either with a unique creation or like a spin on something popular. Like something else I want to talk about was the vampire, mm. which has kind of existed uh, lurking without different, uh, within and without different folklores for like many, many years, but obviously has captured in the last like two centuries our imagination in, a, in quite a unique way. Mm. Yeah, I think I didn't even go into vampires or werewolves or any of the real human yeah. animal hybrids, okay. but it's like, with the supernatural, there's some ways that we don't, we can't articulate it using language. So it's almost like we have to draw on the natural and the things that we've experienced or things that we've witnessed to try and use, to try and find metaphors, I suppose, of how to communicate the fears that we have. So yeah. it's like someone saw a vampire, not a, <laughs> someone saw a vampire, but like blood sucking creatures and were yes. terrified by them. And when they had that reaction, they realized what kind of supernatural fear was manifesting in something natural and i feel like without nature we don't have a way of explaining anything divine or anything other than the exact things we've experienced as individuals because outside of the individual it's like well how do i describe something beautiful other than likening it yes, to a rainbow or something evil yeah it, it dramatizes these concepts like mm -hmm. the vampire, I'm quite sure it's, it sprang out of like sectarian conflicts in Eastern Europe and, and like ethnic uh, rumors and stuff like this. So I was thinking about like the vampire, the werewolf, Medusa, like all these half animal, half or half creature, half human hybrids that tend to be villains. But then I was also thinking about like superheroes. Mm -hmm. You have Batman, Spider Man. What else? There's other ones, right? Black Panther. It's funny, especially Black with, yeah, with most of those, they seem like they'd be villains. Like if you were to I know, that's what I'm present saying. them to someone who wasn't accustomed or mm -hmm. familiar with these things, they'd be like, oh, the Spider-Man, that just sounds yeah. like your worst, my nightmare. Yes, it is. So it's interesting that they were chosen to take back the spider. Yeah. To make the spider human again. There's this, there's this image of like a, what an actual Spider-Man would look like <laughs> on, that I saw once on the internet and I've never searched for again because it terrified me. It's Here just, like, on the internet it's just again. like a man with, <laughs> with eight eyes, but it's kind of creepy. Yeah, it sounds spooky. Very terrifying to me. Mm. But yeah, why do you think, like, why are those things, how can they be good? I understand how they can be more evil, but, mm. you know, and, and not all superheroes have, like, the animal thing, obviously, yeah. but a lot of them do. Well, I think in nature, anything that's powerful is scary to us. Because it's like a butterfly isn't technically powerful, therefore it's not scary. Mm -hmm. But a panther or a bat, they're spooky. You see a bat sucking the blood of like a creature yeah. in the woods and you're terrified. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, anything that has power in nature is scary. Wind is scary, unless it's a light breeze. Yeah. Hurricanes, cyclones. So I think it's kind of why we do it. You know, you mean the thought of those things protecting us, like Batman kind of being the vigilante, you know, saving us. Yeah, so despite the bat being a scary thing, it's like the most powerful thing one could think of, yeah, therefore. It's, it's funny, though, you can contrast Batman and like Dracula. Mm -hmm. But I was also thinking that perhaps it has something to do with the fact that they, generally speaking, like I'm not well versed in the comic book war, but I've seen a decent amount of these movies. It doesn't seem like they seek out these uh, connections. Like mm -hmm. Spider-Man, I'm pretty sure is accidentally bit. Whereas you can imagine like a villain version of Spider-Man, like the lizard guy. Yeah. He deliberately injects himself with the lizard thing, trying to become more, maybe something like mm. that. Batman, it's like a, it's a fear from his childhood. He didn't, you know, choose to fall down there in the well. Mm. I don't know if that's comic accurate, but that's what happened in the movies. <laughs> um, again and, and again. And so it kind of again. afflicts him. It's something that they struggle with. Whereas with Dracula, you can imagine being something that he, he uh, deliberately searched out in, in search for uh, eternal life or whatever. Mm. Yeah, I see. It's the... How the human ego interacts with the... The laws of nature. The laws of nature. Let me put wow. it like that. What did you uh, think for this question? I just made a list. Lists are yeah. helpful. I also made a bit of a list. Yeah. 
So the first one I found was the Basilisk, which, mm. to be completely honest, I only thought was in Harry Potter. So which that... one? Which which Harry Potter? Basilisk is in the second Chamber of Secrets. Okay, well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Ten points to half a bar. <laughs> like sweating, nervous, but I just thought that was only in Harry Potter. That says a lot about my knowledge of ancient mythological creatures, but it's a very old legend. And it comes most likely from people seeing cobras that spit venom. Mm. So the thing with basilisks is they're like a lizard-like, snake-like creature. And they can kill you with a look. So with these cobras that spit venom, it's not a look that kills you, but they can spit their venom at a creature or at a human and kill them. Yeah. So that's likely where that was inspired from. I'm sure there's also a lot of uh, like psychology with regards to when you're looking these beasts in the eyes. Mm. The eyes are the window to the soul. Yeah. Spiders flee before it. Basilisk. I think that might have been a J.K. Rowling invention. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And another reason that people think the basilisk is based on a cobra is because in nature, the meerkat is the only one of the only predators of a cobra. And then in European mythology, the ferret-like, meerkat-like creatures, if you throw it into the basilisk's pit, it will kill it. Oh. So it's like almost double the reason to think that they're inspired by something in nature. Okay. Yeah. My next one was the centaur, which is my only human-animal hybrid. And that was the most simple explanation I've ever seen for something. It was non-horse riding people saw nomadic people riding on horseback. Yes, and, and they, they were, were like, skilled. Whoa, these are centaurs. <laughs> these are like horse humans, but they were really just sitting on their backs. And you have to imagine what they would think of the people they saw today riding boosted boards and yeah. in cars. Or they like, would think we were literal couch potatoes. Yeah. They would think a lot of things about us today. <laughs> <laughs> um, my list also, so it, it was headed by the Kraken, mm -hmm. uh, but keeping on the nautical theme, had the mermaid. Mm -hmm. And there was this quote which was somewhat relevant that said, human nature is internally inconsistent, that our continuities with and our differences from the Earth's other animals are mysterious and profound. Mm -hmm. And the quote kind of went on to talk about this as you know, like a half human, half animal things as like a possible key to a way of feeling at home on earth, saying mm. that mythology or like stories in general are like our striving for more because our existence perhaps is, is lacking in a lot of ways, depending on your perspective or whatever. Yeah, I see. And I thought that was quite cool. Yeah, it's like the only way we can really understand anything is how it relates to us and therefore anthropomorphizing things or... What would that be? Giving spiritual or mythological significance to things is like the best way we can deal with them yes. existing. It's like if we just said, oh, the Kraken's just a big squid in the ocean. It doesn't mean it's not scary, but like having this whole myth around it and how you can fight it and all these things. Yeah. They're empowering mm -hmm. and maybe kept the sailors awake through the night and, or kept them, let them sleep at night rather. Yeah. But the other thing with the Kraken is that it pretty much is true. Yeah, that's like, true. As they described a Kraken, they probably they do exist pretty much. Yeah. So that's why I think it's so fascinating about that one. Mm -hmm. Mermaids, not so much. I think when I was reading about it, it said that they often just mistook manatees for, mm -hmm. for mermaids. Yeah. Flying on a rock in the distance. Mm -hmm. And you also always, when you're in the ocean, can hear just noises. You could hear whale song. You can hear the waves. So I imagine people hearing these things and originally being spooked by them, but then saying, oh, no, it's just a mermaid singing. Don't worry about it. Continuing on the Harry Potter theme that you started. Thank the, you. The Mandrake. Mandrake. Which is one of the few that I could find that is like a, a plant-based uh, creature that's yeah. been mythologized. And these have like a ton of different um, iterations, both for like what they are, what they do, where they came from. But I think generally it's because... It's these roots in real life that just kind of can look like humans. Yeah. So that's it. And there was like a bunch of myths about they spring up from the, the soil where blood has been spilt from like a hanged person and stuff like this. They have a lot of uses in witchcraft and like esotericism as in Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just thought those were neat. They can scream. Yeah, that's true. In real life? No, I mean in the mythology. Yeah. In the real mythology. I see. 
Yeah, I imagine you get some ginger from the grocery store, then you hear the screams of terror as you're peeling it with a spoon. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So another real creature that was on the list of mythologized creatures was the platypus. When it was originally <laughs> discovered by like explorers, so people who like lived where platypus have always lived weren't didn't think they were mythological. But when people like saw them for the first time and sent back drawings and pelts and stuff to the West. Pelts? Yeah. Like, I didn't know that was a thing. They'd send back kind of like a taxidermy platypus. Okay, yes. They just all thought it was a joke. I hope. For like kind of a long time until, <laughs> <laughs> until there were probably pictures and like videos and stuff. And people realized the platypus is in fact a real creature. But I thought that was kind of spoke to how crazy nature is. That there's like, you can have a pretty good knowledge of how things work, how things look. But then we just discover this new thing and it's like, no, that's not real. Yeah. And you can imagine why for so long a lot of these creatures were just, even if someone saw a giant squid washed up on shore, they would just say, no, that's not, it's not real. Or it's the devil's work. Yeah, exactly. I feel like with all the platypus talk, we're taking it back to 2011 yeah, in middle Perry. school, where it was just the coolest thing to wear that on your t-shirt. <laughs> I had several, of course. Yeah, it was maybe it was just the two of us who were thought it was cool, and everyone else thought we were lame. I don't think so. Phineas and Ferb was a big cultural moment. There was, was. A, there was more than one child in my or fellow student of mine who memorized the theme tune mm. and would just sing it. Yeah. Just take a thirty seconds. I guess it was attention seeking, but whatever. <laughs> um, next one on my list is the harpy. We harpy. talked about how winds are evil. Yeah. The harpy. That's like. It's like a wind based being yeah i don't know what this is is it like a fairy but a wind fairy no it's it's not really wind i just mean psychologically i think that might be a part uh, of it they kind of they come on the wind they fly uh, and they are known for abducting people and generally causing chaos they're like half woman half uh they're like winged woman but also half lion and also sometimes they have a bit of snake to them they're greek okay yes yeah that sounds like a lot to have wrapped into one yes like a woman snake would be spooky like a medusa right but then a woman lion wind creature who only causes chaos yes mm. what role did that play in the mythology they were troublemakers okay do you remember watching jason and the argonauts mm -hmm. they come in that movie i see and they flying. cause chaos yes they do okay cool and are they like do they spring up from hell did they come from the gods i think they come from hades yes oh, okay so hades speaking. is sending them possibly to do his dirty work kind of like flying like monkeys mm, in the wizard of oz yeah also um i was thinking about wicked recently for some reason because i read yeah. that book when i was in middle school or high school and um that book is full of human animal hybrids yeah they're called animals kept away yeah i think that that's just one of the best ways that we can kind of reduce an evil because it's like if you had a character who's just purely evil, yes. for the most part today, that'd be like, well, it's kind of just bad storytelling, perhaps. I think it can be done, but it doesn't, it's not that easy to do. And even when it is, it's kind of like, well, I wish there was more than one thing represented, but I feel like maybe by reducing them to these mythological or these animal things it might be easier. I don't know how ethical it is, though, to always use nature to portray evil though well like i said with batman and, and dracula it's also for good yeah it's just like i think the, the conversation is a is a little bit silly because nature is just everything it's true it's like well how could we use nature it's like what there isn't by definition <laughs> there is nothing outside of that yeah that's true except robots mm -hmm. i my vote is use nature as the good guy use technology as the bad guy but i guess it's kind of miyazaki's mantra the next thing on my list is the Cyclops, which I assumed came from some kind of like human, like someone some born with really an eye. really big one person. Or really big eyes. or Yeah. But it was actually came from in Sicily. They found a bunch of these kind of prehistoric elephant skeletons. So there used to be a type of elephant that was much smaller. Okay. So they kind of looked more like big human size. And the place where their trunk goes in looks like a giant eye socket mm. so they thought that these were cyclops. sounds terrifying to be honest yeah and so even in greek mythology the people who wrote about cyclops most likely saw these skeletons which had been kind of put on display as warnings of 
these guys are roaming around be be afraid so i thought that was kind of interesting so that was one of the only ones that i saw and was like oh that's really not what i thought like you think a kraken comes from a squid you think what else a platypus comes from a platypus <laughs> you like you kind of know what these things come from but not that one yes the cyclops that's poseidon's offspring mm-hmm. yeah and another one, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti, all kind of interchangeable. This is another one that like really surprised me. And it's that about 100,000 years ago, so like humans existed. And alongside them, there was the biggest ever ape species, which was about a hun- about 10 feet tall. And it looked just like the Yeti or the Sasquatch does when you see it in cartoons. And yeah, like they just existed together. And most likely, it's believed that humans hunted them to extinction because they were so afraid of them because they looked like just giant hairy humans the rock roc i was recently reading you an excerpt from my uh one of my novels when i was about 11 and 12 mm-hmm. and one of the characters is this big rock which mm-hmm. is basically not like a rock like from a volcano a big flying bird mm-hmm. from middle eastern folklore these guys yeah they're in the a thousand and one nights they are generally malevolent they okay. kind of hunt sailors and things like that. I see. They remind me a little bit of, in Odysseus, in the Odyssey rather, Charybdis mm-hmm. coming down. That's kind of what the vibe I was getting. I haven't read Arabian Nights, but I think that's what it is. Um, and they also, it came, it brought to mind the eagles. The eagles are coming from mm-hmm. Tolkien, from Lord of the Rings. What do you think about those guys? Because I always thought they seem a little bit out of place in the Middle <laughs> Earth. I mean, there aren't many animals in middle earth that are sentient there's a big thing in the lake yeah but there there are not many like sentient creatures yeah that's true then they just kind of arrive sometimes yeah especially the eagles because i often think why aren't they just kind of always helping yeah are they too good for the that's what i was that's the hobbits that's what i find find interesting with the eagles it's similar to um the poem that i read about the kraken and that they just seem to exist outside of mm-hmm. like they're the, only awakened the realm. when they're yeah. really summoned by the forces of good or sure. evil. Okay. Mm. The next thing is the unicorn, which I assumed was inspired by some kind of horse, but it was actually two things. Early unicorns were described just like they were just rhinos. People thought the rhinos were unicorns, and that's how they were described in literature. But then during the Renaissance, people would collect narwhal tusks and sell them kind of on the black market, kind of on the real market in Europe, and sell them as unicorn horns. And people would pay a lot of money. The queen even bought one. Not the queen, but like one of the queens bought them. And they were very expensive, as you can yeah. imagine, for these unreal horns. I think people think that I think they also have like an alchemy. Yeah. significance they probably can make you live forever yes and yeah so the narwhal horn trade but then eventually that was disproven once again with the dawn of images and <laughs> literacy and science that's a shame though isn't it yeah no not really um <laughs> along those lines my last one is the pegasus hmm. one of my favorite mythological creatures of course yeah. has several different kind of origin stories i think the main one is that it's it came from the blood of medusa's neck when she was beheaded. Mm, so I something see. good stemming from something bad. And also the reason I want to talk about the Pegasus is because um, one of the, the stories about them is that every time they tread, every time one of their hooves touches the earth, like a nice water spring comes from that. And it's this idea that a lot of origin stories for creation for the planet are that it was somehow shaped, you know, either created or like shaped in some way by big mythological creatures Mm -hmm. big beings yeah like there's some there were some uh peoples that thought that mammoths made mountains with that with their tusks yeah that's a really cool idea i mean there's the whole like turtle island which is north america it's floating on the turtle's back which is a beautiful image but i like the idea of these giant creatures just like holding us up or yeah a mountain just being like the back of a giant or whatever pretty cool Definitely would make you respect nature a lot more. If you thought that this was the hub of a divine being that has made this little imprint, you wouldn't want to dump your plastic bottles in there. My final one plays to the dinosaurs 
the griffin is a half lion, half eagle creature that was believed to guard gold. And this most likely came from the fact that in the Gobi Desert, in gold mines, as people dug down, they found these proter- proceratops skeletons, which just look like half eagle, half really? lions, and they were very afraid. Ooh. And they would perpetuate these stories of them having to fight off these griffins. And obviously, they're just kind of making it up to make it a little more cool, I which think is what it sounds like. I, I was thinking about that because there's a lot of obviously like psychological reasons about why we mythologize and Joseph Campbell and Jung and all that. And I, I put a lot of, st- of stock into that. Like, I think it's mm-hmm. all true. But I also think that historically, life was just very, very, very hard and dark for people. Mm-hmm. And so it was just fun. Yeah. It was just, it provided a bit of levity quite often. I, th- mm-hmm. I think that's, I mean, that's all it is now. Yeah. Or f- for the most part. Anyway. Yeah, it used to have a bit more of a like, don't go into the forest at night because the Yeti will get you. Mm. Um, but it also was, well, I'm out here digging a hole in the desert for 16 hours a day. What can I tell people that I'm doing? Oh, I'm also fighting off griffins yeah, on the side. Exactly. And imagine the people who originally found dinosaur bones and stuff. It's like, okay, I found this cool bone. But like people would probably, the first thing they would ask is, what is it? So you'd have to like make something up. Be like, well, it's a dragon bone or it's a mm-hmm. dragon tooth. And yeah, I think it's kind of fun. But now it's just for fun. There's no weight to it. Shame. Yeah. Is that your last one? <laughs> yeah. So speaking of weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, mm-hmm. a very light creature. Oh, yeah. I.e. not very heavy. Ah. One of my favorite fantastical slash mythological beings. Yes. Do you know what they're called? They're called the the Koroks? Yes, the Koroks. This is the organism of the week for this week. On Solar Scene, we always have... An organism of the week that we kind of feature this week, of course, it's fantastical. I feel like quite often we do things that aren't <laughs> real, maybe like a third of the time, which is probably too much. <laughs> um, but do you want to describe these guys to the audience who perhaps have never played a Zelda game? So Koroks are little tiny creatures that look like seeds because they have seeds. Korok seeds, yeah. And they also have leaf masks. So they have ears that are pointy, hands and feet that are pointy. So they're like six-pointed stars with leaf masks, and they usually have these little umbrellas or sticks or berries that they hold, and they usually appear in natural parts, but the evil guys in Zelda capture them, and then you have to release them. I believe that's all I know about corals. I think it's something like that, yeah. Uh, They can fly quite often through little propeller leaves. Um, They're woodland beings. They make a tinkly sound as they move. That's that's one of their nice traits. They kind of protect the forest slash are protected by the great Deku tree. And they are, or the word comes from, let me try and pronounce this right, Koropokuru, which is a Japanese kind of folklore being that lives in some plants, hides there. So there's that. <laughs> uh, the exact description from Zeldapedia says, they are small wooden people who wear leaf masks over their faces. Their personalities may differ greatly and are often reflected in their masks. Ah. As you said, they like to hide. They're mischievous. Um, yeah, that's about it. But I was also thinking about other types of forest sprites. Like mm-hmm. in Studio Ghibli, I think it's in Mononoke. There's those white guys. Mm-hmm. In the trees, those spirits. I think they're called the, as well. the Kodama. Mm-hmm. And also in Brave the Pixar movie, but generally just in English folklore, there's the -the Will-O-The-Wisps, which are just kind of these disembodied orbs, I guess, that lead people through the... Mm. I don't know if they lead them into danger or through danger, but Mm. yes, those are them. So what do you think about forest sprites? Let me put it like that. I feel like as kids, we all probably invent our own version of these. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, like you don't think they're real, but it's like you see a firefly or Mm -hmm. you see a leaf that's like floating a little too long in the air you know and you're kind of like i think there might be a little spirit in there a little sprite like being yes bugs are kind of like this to kids and yeah i just i just thought of this now but i definitely think that we all invent some version of this it depends on exactly where you live exactly how you were raised like perhaps you'd have different words for it but i think we all have these in our history yeah. Also, another reason I chose the Korok is because 
I just always think that they should exist. Yeah. Like when I'm, I was going to try and just make my own organism for this, mm. but it just re- ended up resembling a lot the Korok because I just think that there's a there's a space that should be filled. I mean, these are a little bit too human like. Mm-hmm. Like they shouldn't be so anthropomorphic. But in terms of a a kind of wooden, not quite mammal, very small thing that inhabits mm-hmm. forests runs up into i just think those should exist i guess they kind of like are the wind but they aren't the wind they're like bugs but they're not bugs i love this idea and i think if i ever write a book i'm going to steal your idea and put them in you mean nintendo's well world religions yes idea because it probably exists all over the place but yeah i'm glad these guys are the organism of the week i think the reason we have so many mythological creatures is because the soul scene is a slightly mythological idea yeah of course it is and it's something to inspire us to keep doing the kind of gritty work of environmental activism and give you something to look forward to or something to rally around perhaps well speaking of rallies around yesterday um in montreal there was a big protest against cop 15 15? yeah forget the numbers Uh, we won't get into the politics of you know that but it's a biodiversity summit or conference Mm -hmm. and everyone was on the street and it was quite nice to see all the different masks and um, just like effigies under which people were rallying. Mm-hmm. And there was like a big snake that people were carrying in the mm-hmm. crowd or there was like a, a wolf, I think. Yeah, there was a bee on a stick. Yes, a bee on a stick. Someone had antlers. Yeah. Things like this. It was one of the most organized protests I've ever seen. Like they were very clearly protesting against one thing and for one thing, I believe which usually it's more like we just are going to get together and protest for the climate, which is so huge. Yeah. But it's like if you are super specific, like if you go to H&M, like the girl who like sat in the window of H&M and said, we're going to shut down this greenwashing campaign and then literally the next day they have to take it down. Like if you're really specific and you're asking for something, it's good. So it's like if you're at a protest, I would be mentally asking for the solo scene. And if someone interviewed me, I could refer them to this. Right, because so this you're like... <laughs> self-promoting hack. No, but this is my like <laughs> this is my attempt to articulate exactly what the ideal future is. So that if someone asked me, I would have a thing. I don't think everyone needs to have a solo scene podcast. Yeah. But they should have an idea of the mythological creature that they want to bring back. <laughs> or oh, to bring into existence. Yeah, that they want science to work on. <laughs> So the next question is the environmental impact of leisure. I thought this would be like a cut and dry, pretty easy question. Okay. But then when you break down what leisure is, there's a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. And the first thing I wanted to talk about is streaming. Because usually when you'd ask a question like this, you'd think of camping, skiing, nature things. But this is my one non nature thing, one of two. And streaming accounts for 1% of global emissions, which is like not crazy. And it's a pretty easy solution, which would be green grids. But it's still like, you got to think about these things. The amount of streaming that we're doing globally, music, videos, etc. It's causing an environmental impact. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Digital entropy. I don't think, I feel like the cat's out of the bag with streaming, unfortunately. Yeah. But in the solar scene, people do it less. As you say, there are green grids. I kind of tackled the question from... From just a what's it like in the solo scene point of view, because yeah. I thought that would be healthier for me to think about um, rather than just a, a list of bad things, <laughs> which perhaps you did. Yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> so I just kind of listed things in the solo scene, restoring, growing, unpolluting, building, clean, healthy, mm. fern gully. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking about fern gully because... What I like about that movie is that it has a very childlike aesthetic division between what's good and what's bad. And what's bad has plumes of black smoke and heavy machinery and loud noises. And fire and... But quite often to people that is recreational. Mm-hmm. Thinking about like hot rod culture. Yeah. And you know, just like... ATVs. Yeah. RVs. Mm. I don't want to... <laughs> I mean, I'm sure those things are very exhilarating and fun for people. But I, I just like the fun goey cleanliness aesthetic i think that's generally mm-hmm. there's just there's never anything wrong with that whereas machinery there quite often is something yeah. wrong with it and uh yeah yeah pleasure all the articles i was reading on this it was like it depends on what you're doing in nature because i went into like a bunch of different things you could do and it's like going down a trail on f- on foot versus on skis versus on an atv 
it's like, well, I'm just going down this trail. But it's like one of those things is going to have a much greater negative impact than the other. But let me put it like this. What if it was um, an electric ATV that was charged using solar energy? And if it was a silent engine? It would have less of an impact. Yeah. But it's still like just going into nature with these heavy things. (laughs) It's like when you... Soil compaction has a lot of negative impacts. It causes runoff. It causes soil degradation because when you compact the soil, it becomes anaerobic. So like there's no air in there. So the fungi can't do their thing. Bugs can't do their thing. Animals can't burrow as easily. They also, the reason it causes runoff is because there's no, now no area for the water to go into. And then the water just kind of drags the topsoil away and then it erodes. Mm-hmm. And so I think when we are in nature, this is kind of definitely a solacing thing of trying to find a way to have trails that don't compact or have some kind of a mechanism that you put in through the woods. Yeah, that doesn't cause soil compaction because I think when you're doing leave no trace and trying to not tread the same trails, that also has a lot of issues because then you're cutting your own path or you're you're almost disturbing more of the woods. So it's some somewhere in between those two things. Yeah, as always, it's about finding the level of environmental impact that we're okay with. Mm-hmm. Also, I was thinking about camping and hiking. And something that's always rubbed me the wrong way about both those terms, but especially hiking, is the fact that it's a word. Because mm-hmm. I'm always just... I'm always just a bit confused because it just seems to me like, isn't this just walking? Mm -hmm. This just means going for a walk. Yeah. So I just think that in the solo scene, we don't have that word hiking Mm. because there is much less of a distinguishing between, well, here's our regular life and here's our life a week, a year when we go camping. Yeah. And so we can actually walk uh, with grass beneath our feet. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, this is walking. Yeah. Or, Or camping is just, it's just being. Yeah, this was a big thing I kept that kept coming up for me with this question of like leisure. And it's like if there weren't industries built around all of our hobbies, I think it'd be much better for the environment. So like even crafting, which is like a hobby a lot of people have, it's like the amount of things you're sold and the amount of things you have to try and fail and throw out. And like we're amateurs at everything when it comes to crafts for the most part or DIYing solutions. So I think the environmental impact is greater than if we were just like, okay, I'm going to crochet. I have a hook. I have this yarn that I get from the yarn store here. But as it is, it's like you have a yarn subscription box, you have a bunch of different <laughs> hooks that are all made of plastic, and you yeah. mess up and you just kind of throw it out because you're like, well, I don't know. You probably, I mean, you can still choose a simple way. Yeah, of course. But people don't. Yeah, we're marketed reasons. too too much. And yeah, it's... That materialism, mm-hmm. uh, the latent materialism in all of us often just springs up, especially around this time of year. Yeah. The Christmas time of year. It's true. Or the holidays. Mm-hmm. Um I was thinking about that because it's a bit of a, of a strange thing to mention, but when writing, I can sometimes feel a little, writing fiction, I sometimes feel a little bit um, devoid of ideas because it's like, what can you actually have characters do? They mm-hmm. can talk, they can fight, they can work, they can kind of play. It's like there's, or they can maybe transport themselves, like move. Yeah. Like there isn't, there isn't much, and then you can like, extrapolate this is like a really roundabout way of thinking but you can extrapolate that from fictional characters to just real people yeah that there's really only those five things you can Mm -hmm. ever be doing like that's it yeah but i think that so often these days or maybe always like i was talking about we kind of have this feeling that we're always yearning for more but now we can um delude ourselves into thinking that we're filling it more often by Mm -hmm. purchasing like that's that's something i didn't mention shopping like i think we need to enjoy those things more appreciate them more So that's, you know, it's like every single culture. It's like every time they have a celebration or a festival, what are they doing in those things? Eating, there's food, there's music, gathering, there's gathers. Yeah. Like there there (laughs) isn't, like there just aren't other things beyond those things. Like that is what life is. Mm -hmm. But we don't dive into it. It's like we kind of, it's like we meet these five needs. We're like, okay, I eat the bare minimum. I do the bare minimum exercise. Yeah. Because it's almost as if if we think we meet all these, then we get to transcend and do these other things that don't actually exist. Well, think about Christmas. Like, this time Mm -hmm. of year is our biggest holiday, pretty much, our biggest festive time. And it's like, well, yeah, there's food and, yeah, maybe there's gathering. But what I really care about is what I'm going to unwrap. Oh, yeah. Like, that's become the sixth thing. And I don't, Mm -hmm. that's really, you know, there's waste and there's all the, the, 
industrial entropy that goes into that that isn't mm -hmm. good really yeah i think we need to unindustrialize the hobby industry of just like let people okay you camp that's fine just wear your clothes you don't need special camping clothes yeah you don't need special gym clothes like just do these things yeah that's a good point about <laughs> exercise yeah like that's a good example it's like you don't you don't need specific ex exercise clothes mm -hmm. So I think the environmental impact of leisure is greatly exacerbated by materialism and our our weakness of like giving into these things. It is. But it's not weakness, it's just like I think we're worn down so much. It's like you can try and be strong, try and not shop. I feel like I do this every Christmas, and then you're always worn down into thinking it's insufficient, or it's like you need to get something more, you need to do something more in order for it to actually be special. So that's definitely part of it but there are a few environmental impacts of leisure that we can avoid and these are things i'm going to talk about for the solo scene of education surrounding camping and outdoor activities so right now education and also research i suppose until recently we didn't know that wearing sunscreen into the ocean was like causing coral reef damage or causing ecosystem damage but then we've recently learned that and a lot of companies are now selling mineral sunscreens instead of chemical sunscreens which are just as effective but they don't cause habitat loss or habitat degradation mm -hmm. so like there's a lot of research into these different types of things of like how to most efficiently dispose of waste when you're in the forest like human waste or food waste without harming ecosystems yeah and also education so it's like the average person doesn't know too much about wildfire prevention so they go camping they have a wild they have a bonfire they leave the ashes whatever causes a wildfire so it's just like education will be a big part of it. Gender reveal parties. Yeah, we don't want any of those in the soul scene because they might cause a wildfire. Are we going to have those? No. You and I? I don't think so. <laughs> I have no intention of doing that. Okay. Yeah. I'm not super into finding out the gender of a baby before it's born. We could stream it for solo scene. Yeah, we could do a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's the gender reveal podcast. Yeah. The GRP, yeah. Mm hmm Okay, maybe we'll keep that in our back pocket. But what this question of leisure brings to my mind is a small question, but it's um, the purpose of human race, like the purpose of our species. <laughs> it's, I don't know if we can tack this on for a couple of minutes or perhaps talk about it next week. I but what I mean fine. by this is like the ideal, so when you talk to people who are very into sustainability, it seems like the, their ideal um, society is one that... in infinitely or near infinitely can sustain itself mm -hmm. so it's just infinitely being yeah yeah we could talk about the but what this is what i mean like <laughs> you know but some people think it's all about exploration colonizing mm -hmm. space you know moving to different planets like what is yeah. what's the, what what are we trying to do here is what i'm saying yeah i think this is wrapped in with nature i really do yeah we can try and talk about that next week yes about. yes um, I had another question that is related to this, and it was, what is ecotourism? Which is not related to what you just asked, but related to this question. Yeah, we can talk about that. So I think that'd be a good question to answer. But I think for a tertiary question, yeah. we should have something that does not relate to humans so much. What about the recycling systems of the solar scene? Ah. Because we haven't talked a lot about waste, but obviously no, we haven't. there's a uh, middle school's favorite uh, PowerPoint thing, which is the... <laughs> The Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. Straws. Did you know about them? Mm. Those are awful. Yeah. Let's so, talk about yeah, waste. Yeah, let's talk about that. Well, I'm kind of excited to talk about waste. It's weirdly one of... <laughs> the I way feel you like... said that sounded like a YouTuber. Let's talk about waste. Yeah. I think waste <laughs> is partially what got me into sustainability. So it is going to be like yeah, a... Ever since you saw a picture with a turtle with a uh, soda, whatever those things are called, around its neck. Yeah. That didn't do it for me, but a balloon. Did it for some people. Yeah. The balloon popped. Mm. And it goes into the ocean and they think it's a jellyfish. And then they eat it and they choke. Yeah. Did you know about that? <laughs> no, I didn't know about that. <laughs> so that sounds good. Uh, a couple more things about the impact of leisure. Golf. I say, well, I shouldn't say that on the podcast. I say down with golf. No more golf in the solo scene. Hmm. You don't like that shade of green? Don't like that shade of green. Don't like how many pesticides, herbicides, right. and if water waste. If you had waste. your way, they'd just be playing golf in the metaverse on some kind of Wii Sports uh, yeah, modernized version of that. What but we were against that kind of thing. 
for the golfers. See, this is why you contradict yourself. Uh, no, the golfers, if they really want to golf, let them, let them do what they want, but not in nature. Because it's literally just a giant monocrop of grass. And you're fragmenting habitats. And you're just terraforming these, like, mm. ugly patches of green. High School Musical 2, though. Mm. Ah, got you there, didn't I? The thing with that is it's in a desert. Right. So it's even worse. Bad so, way. like, maybe we can have <laughs> dust golf patches. It doesn't need to be green. Okay. That's my proposal. And they're, like, they're hitting around a bowl, but it turns out it's an armadillo that has like, yeah. unrolled itself. Yeah, they can do that on this list, and it's fine. In the solo scene, there won't be RVs. People will camp, of course. It'll either be cabins or tents. None of these rolling stink chariot tents. I don't like them. Keep it coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the solo scene, people will know not to feed the ducks, etc. Because <laughs> we disturb their normal rhythms, their normal oh. migration patterns. Right. I know it's fun. I know that you like your mini wheats for the... I don't squirrels. give it to them. I just think it's okay <laughs> sometimes. So pigeons, squirrels, like these these animals that have become something else uh, in cities, you don't... Yeah. As much as I like squirrels and I like this these species that just randomly exist with us in cities <laughs> yeah, and huge populations, that? and there's only a couple of them, like I like <laughs> them, but in the solo scene, I think it'll just be actual biodiversity and actual natural okay. things living with us instead of just these unnatural pigeons yeah. and what squirrels. what is with them? They kind of know. sold their souls. Yeah. The other animals probably laugh at them. Yeah. What do people call pigeons? Oh, I need my mini wheat. Sky rats? Yeah. Need my mini wheats. <laughs> oh, I don't hibernate. They actually just take me in for the winter. I haven't had any bread in a while. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll know a bit more about that. We'll know a bit more about like collecting firewood from nearby campsites. And campsites will probably also not exist. It'll just be like, it'll be a bit different. Yeah. And there is one more thing which is like kind of challenging to talk about because I'm not neo Malthusian, but I also think the number of people is like definitely a big challenge of trying to fight climate change when you're trying to do so without also tackling well-being. Because if you're trying to fight climate change without incorporating well-being, then it's just like almost impossible. But I think if you do both together, well, it's, it's possible. Yeah, it's oppressive. So a big issue that I kept saw coming up about the impact of leisure on nature is the impact that it has on other people's psyches. So it's like when you go to the mall, you expect it to be crowded. So like there's certain types of leisure that are fine to be overcrowded like it's fine to just go to the theater you expect there to be 200 people there but when you go into nature if you go camping or you go hiking you expect freedom quiet no other people around but the way that things are kind of laid out it's like from montreal you can probably only get to two parks yeah so therefore those are always going to be crowded so in the solo scene there'll just be like more options so that everyone won't be going to the exact same places it's kind of like i was discussing with the national parks in the solo scene of like They'll pop up. They'll be open during different times. So it's like we can all just have quiet. Like there's enough space. We need to be able to get to it sustainably without cars and have the knowledge of like, okay, I want to just go into the wilderness and being able to do that. Because right now, if you want to go camping, you have to go to a campsite where there's like 500 lots. So therefore, there's like 5,000 people there, a ton of a lot. And it doesn't feel like you're actually in nature. And then that itch never gets scratched and you never develop those nature survival skills that you're kind of craving. Nice idea. Yep. Can you sign us off with the Korox? Thank you all for listening. We will see you next week for week eight of the nature series. Doo -doo 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 -doo.